Recall that back when we first defined functions, we said that a function is a relation, that is a collection of inputs and outputs, where every input has only one output. Or in other words, if I know the input to a function, I can determine the output uh, exactly, just based on that input. So examples that we had involved uh, the relation of, say, a state, to, uh, or rather a United States senator, to the state that they represent. Uh, and that sort of relation is a function because every senator uh, represents only one state. However, there are some functions that also have the property that every output only has one input to go along with it. And those functions are important to us, and we're going to give them a name. Uh, now, the function that I just mentioned, uh, associating a, uh, a senator to a state, uh, does not have this property. Uh, if I give you a particular senator, you can tell me what state they represent, but if I tell you a state, well, there's more than one senator that, uh, that represents that state. And so if I, um, if I tell you the output to this function, that doesn't determine what the input is. However, if I look at the function which takes the governor, which takes a governor to the state that they are the governor of, this does have the property that if I tell you a particular state, they, then you'll be able to tell me the governor and vice versa. So in this second relationship of governor to state, if, if you know an input, a governor, you can tell what state goes with it. And if you're told a state, you can tell what governor goes with it. And this is what we call a one-to-one -one function. A one-to-one -one function is going to be a function that matches up each input with exactly one output and vice versa. So, uh, more precisely, a function f is called one-to-one -one if every output in the range of f has only one input uh, that uh, that goes to it. Another way of saying this is the following. In other words, if we have that f of x1 equals f of x2, that is if we've got two outputs of a function that are equal, then that means that x1 has to equal x2. If two outputs are equal, then their corresponding inputs have to be equal. Or equivalently, another way of, of looking at it, which is completely logically equivalent, if x1 is not equal to x2 as two elements in the domain, then f of x1, the outputs associated to the two of them, uh, is not equal to f of x2. So these are all different ways of saying the same thing. And any function which satisfies these properties is called one to one. And the intuition uh, is that a one to one function uh, this is also sometimes written uh, as one hyphen one, meaning one to one. Uh, a one-to-one -one function uh, matches uh, inputs and outputs uh, without any repeats, either in inputs or in outputs. Uh, now, when we have a one-to-one -one function, there are uh, quite a lot of things that we can do with it, but before we 
get into that, we need to talk about how we can determine whether a function is one to one or not. Now, it turns out that showing that a function is one to one is harder than showing that a function is not one to one if it happens to not be. So, for example, uh, let's show that the function f of x equals x squared is not one to one. Uh, we do this by finding uh, two different inputs, uh, x1 and x2, that are not the same, such that f of x1 equals f of x2. And we just have to find specific numbers here. If uh, All we have to do is find a specific pair of x1 and x2 so that when you plug them into the function, you get the same number out of it, you get the same input. So we have lots of options here, but one of the options would be the following. Uh, we can take that f of two is two squared, which is four, but that's all the, also the same as f of negative two. So what we have is that the output Four in the range of f has two different inputs that go to it, two and negative two. Now this doesn't mean that f is not a function, it still is a function, every input only has one output to it, but we don't have that each output only has one input, and so we say that the function is not one-to-one. -one. Now, on the other hand, we can take something like uh, uh, g of x equals uh, x plus 1 over 4. Now, it turns out that this function is 1 to 1. And let's see how that goes. So let's show that g is 1 to 1. What the most efficient way of doing this is algebraically is the following. So let's just let x1 and x2 be such that uh, g of x1 equals g of x2, which means, of course, that x1 plus 1 over 4 equals x2 plus 1 over 4. And uh, so we're using uh, one of the conditions from the previous slide, we know that a function is one-to-one -one if, when, uh, whenever you have that g of x1 equals g of x2, we need to have that x1 equals x2. Now, if we take this equation, x1 plus one over four equals x2 plus one equals four, and let's try to rearrange uh, and or let, let me just say we want to solve for x1 I want to get x1 by itself so uh, we get x1 plus 1 over 4 equals x2 plus 1 over 4 uh, and this won't take much we can multiply both sides by 4 and uh, when we do that we actually get cancellation of all the denominators and so we get that x1 plus 1 equals x2 plus 1. And now if we subtract 1 from both sides, we get that x1 equals x2. So what we found is that if g of x1 equals g of x2, then x1 has to equal x2. This is, in fact, the definition of what it means for g to be 1 to 1. Uh, on the other hand, if we try doing the same thing with the previous problem, uh, it wouldn't work. Let's see how that goes. Uh, 
Uh, so let's look at f of x equals x squared again. Uh, if we let f of x1 equal f of x2, assume that we've got the same outputs for, uh, for the inputs x1 and x2, then that means that x1 squared equals x2 squared. And now if we try to solve for x1, what we get uh, is we take the square root of both sides uh, and we get that x1 is equal to plus or minus the square root of x2 squared. But remember that the, uh, that the square root of x2 squared is not necessarily x2, it's actually the absolute value of x2. So we get that x1 is either the absolute value of x2 or it's the opposite of the absolute value of x2. So in particular, we don't get that x1 equals x2. That's one of the possibilities, but it's not the only possibility. And so we have that f is not one to one. Now, this uh, algebraic technique of finding out whether a function is one to one uh, is something that uh, works well uh, when you have the formulas and when the formulas are relatively simple. There is another way of doing it graphically which is often more efficient. So uh, let's look at our graphical method uh, or our graphical test for a function being one to one and it's called the horizontal line test. Now, uh, you can actually probably already guess what the horizontal line test says um, based on the vertical line test, which we had for testing whether a function is, uh, or a relation rather, is a function. And the horizontal line test says that if a horizontal line passes through a graph more than once uh, the function is not one-to-one -one. and otherwise it is so let's uh, let's look and see why this is the case and we'll take a couple different examples one of a function or a graph which does pass the horizontal line test and one of a function which doesn't so let's start with this function over here we'll call this y equals f of x and then we'll have another one over here this will be y equals g of x so let's look at what the horizontal line test says. The horizontal line test says we want to take a horizontal line and move it uh, everywhere uh, on the graph. We want to consider all the different horizontal lines that we could draw and ask at every point, does it cross the graph more than once? And we can see that this uh, function on the left uh, passes the horizontal line test, that is a horizontal line never crosses the graph more than once, whereas over here on the right we can see that sometimes it does. Now it doesn't always, the a horizontal line right here only crosses the graph once, but uh, in order to, to pass the horizontal line test um, you can't have any horizontal lines that cross the graph more than once. And in this case, we definitely have some in here. Uh, so let's see what this means uh, by looking at this right-hand graph here. The reason why the horizontal line test means anything is because a horizontal line corresponds to all of the points on the graph that have a particular y value. Uh, let me let me call this y value b here. 
Now, that means that this graph here is the line y equals b. And all of the points that are on the graph and on the red line are points that have a y value of uh, whatever this number b is. Now, we don't know uh, uh, from this graph exactly what the x values are that go with it. I'll just go ahead and label them x1, x2, and x3. But the point is that we have that g of x1 equals g of x2, but x1 does not equal x2. We have two different x values down here, x1 and x2, that have the same y value, uh, but aren't, uh, but the x values aren't equal. In other words, we have two inputs to the function, namely x1 and x2, that have the same output of b, even though they're not the same. Therefore, g is not one to one. If I ask you, what's the input to this function that gives you an output of b, you can't tell me just a single number. You've got to give me three numbers, actually. Uh, and so this function is not one-to-one. -one. On the other hand, if I look at the uh, left graph, and we'll say the same thing, uh, and we'll call that label b, and I ask you, what's the x value that corresponds to a y value of b, you'll be able to tell me just a single number, just the single number uh, a in this case, which uh, whatever, uh, whatever this a is. So we can use the horizontal line test in order to check and see whether functions are one-to-one -one or not. And when we're dealing with functions that we're familiar with, we can use this to, uh, to answer the question uh, often very easily. So uh, let's see an example of that. Uh, is the function uh, f of x equals uh, 2 plus the square root of x minus 3 1 to 1? Well, uh, one way of doing this would be to graph out this function. Now, for this function, we're going to need to use some of the facts that we know about transforming functions. So uh, let's, uh, let's look at this. Uh, we see that this function here is a transformation of the graph of y equals square root of x. And we can see that two things have happened here. Uh, we can see from the minus 3 inside the function that we shift that we're shifting to the right by 3 and the adding 2 on the outside means that we're shifting up by 2 so in order to graph this first I'll just graph the uh, graph the function y equals square root of x so y equals square root of x uh, looks like, uh, let me give myself a grid to work with here. So we have the point zero, zero on the graph of y equals square root of x. We've got the point one, one. Uh, we have the point 4, 2, the point 9, 3, and so forth. So we have that the graph of y equals square root of x looks like this. And now our function f is going to be the, it's going to have the same graph, but shifted up by 2 and to the right by 3. So the point zero, zero is going to uh, get mapped to the point uh, three comma two. Uh, the point one, one will get uh, moved to the point 
4 comma 3. The point 4 comma 2 is going to be shifted up by 2 to the right by 3, which will give us 7, 4. And the point 9, 3 will go up by 2 and to the right by 3. And that will give us the point 12 comma 5. So here's the graph of y equals f of x. It's the square root of, uh, or this variation on the square root of uh, x function. And so now if we take a horizontal line and consider a horizontal line at all positions, we see that it never crosses the blue graph, the graph of our function, more than once. Sometimes it crosses the graph zero times, that's okay. Sometimes it crosses the graph once, that's okay. And it never crosses the graph twice. Therefore, this function, f of x, is one to one. So this means f is in fact one to one. All right, so uh, the reason why we care about one-to-one -one functions is because they allow us to um, take an output to the function and find the input that's associated to it. The reason why we care about that is because that means that if we reverse the roles of the inputs and the outputs, we still get a function. Let's look at the following uh, sort of cartoon. Let's uh, consider a function that uh, that is very simple, just has uh, four elements over here in, uh, in its domain and four elements in its range. And let's suppose that we have uh, this function, which maps things this way. Now we see that this function here is one to one. You'll notice that every output to this function only has one input that goes along with it. So each of y1, y2, y3, and y4 only have one x value that, uh, that gets associated to it under this function. So this function is one to one. So let's look at what happens if I reverse the directions of all the arrows. Uh, and, and see what I get next. If I exchange the roles of the inputs and the outputs, then we'll get the following. So x1 used to go to y1, so now y1 goes to x1. x2 went to y3, so now y3 goes to x2. x3 went to y2, so y2 goes to x3. x4 goes to y4, so y4 goes to x4. And so this relation that we got just by exchanging the roles of the inputs and outputs is a function. So you'll notice that every uh, every input to this function, which are now the y values, only goes to one output. And by contrast, let's look at a function which is not one to one. If we take this function, x1 goes to y2, x2 goes to y1, x3 goes to y3, and x4 goes to y2, you'll notice that this function is not one-to-one. -one because there are two different inputs that go to y2. Both x1 and x4 go to y2, and therefore this function is not one-to-one. -one. Now let's see what happens when we take this relation and reverse the roles of the inputs and the outputs.
Now, before we had x1 going to y2, so now I'll have y2 going to x1, x2 going to y1, so y1 goes to x2, x3 goes to y3, so now y3 goes to x3, and x4 goes to y2, so now y2 goes to x4. And what you'll notice is that here, now that we've reversed all of the arrows, uh, exchanged all the roles of inputs and outputs, this relation is not a function. Because uh, the input y2 to this relation has more than one output that goes along with it because we've exchanged the roles of the inputs and the outputs. I'm going to keep making reference to exchanging the roles of the inputs and the outputs because that's very, very important to what comes next. So this process of reversing the arrows, changing the inputs and the outputs or exchanging them is a very important uh, operation that we can do on a function, but it only gives us a function back if we started with a one-to-one -one function. Uh, so uh, this is the main reason why we care about one-to-one -one functions. So let's define the inverse function. So given a one to one function f, there is a function which we denote f inverse. So f with a little negative one in the exponent slot. This is not an exponent. It's merely a notation indicating inverse. So there is a function f inverse uh, such that uh, f of x equals y if and only if f inverse of y equals x. f inverse is called the inverse of f, as I've been uh, as I've been calling it. And the idea is that f inverse sort of undoes f. If we think of the functions as uh, machines the way that we did last time, and I've got some something that goes into the function, uh, the machine f, and comes out with f of x, and there's the machine f inverse, well then what f inverse does is exactly the opposite of what, uh, of what f does. If I take some input y here, I get f inverse of y. But the point is that if I connect these up, then I should get back exactly what I started. So uh, sort of cartooning that out. If I take an x and I plug it into the machine f and get f of x out of that, and then I plug that into the machine f inverse, I should just get x back out. So whatever f does, f inverse undoes. We can actually use this as, um, as another definition of, of inverse, or I like to think of it more as a test to see whether two inverses or two functions rather are inverses of one another. So test for inverses. So two functions f and g are inverses of each other if and only if we have two conditions. Uh, f composed with g of x is x for all x in the domain of g and g composed with f of x 
equals x for all x in the domain of f. So uh, we can use this test together with the composition function that we talked about, a uh, composition operation that we talked about last time in order to confirm that two functions are inverses of one another. Let's see how this works. Uh, let's show that uh, f of x equals x plus 2 over 3 and g of x equals 3x minus 2 are inverses of one another. All right, so to do this, what we're going to do is evaluate each of these compositions. Now, I need to emphasize it's very, very important that you always check both compositions. It's possible for a pair of functions to satisfy one of these equations in this test, but not the other. So you always need to check both. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's first check f composed with g of x. We know by definition that this is f of g of x, which means we're looking at f of 3x minus 2. So now we're going to take the expression 3x minus 2 and plug it into the f function where x goes. So this is going to be 3x minus 2 plus 2 over 3. Now simplifying this, we have that 3x minus 2 plus 2 in the numerator just becomes 3x. And now we have 3x over 3. We can cancel the 3s and be left with just x. All right, that's great. That means that if we take the function x, or I'm sorry, if we take an element x and apply the function g to it, we'll get some number. But then if we apply the function f to that number, we'll get back to the number x that we started with. In other words, whatever g did, f undid it. And let's make sure it works the other way. Let's check g composed with f of x. That's g of f of x. So that's g of x plus 2 over 3. Once again, we'll plug x plus 2 over 3 into the function g of x. We get 3 times x plus 2 over 3. Uh, minus 2. Now the 3 outside and the 3 in the denominator can cancel, and we're left with x plus 2 minus 2, which simplifies down to just x. So this uh, shows that if I take an element x, apply f to it, and then apply g to it, I get back the original number I started with. So whatever f did, g undid. So this means that uh, g is the inverse of f, or equivalently, we could write that f is the inverse of g. Both of those are true. The inverse of the inverse is the original function. Uh, and so in this case, we have confirmed that f and g are inverses of one another. Let's look at another example. Are the functions f of x equals uh, x plus 2, uh, or sorry, 3x plus 2, and g of x equals 1 third x minus 2 inverses. All right, so let's check. Our test for inverses really is our most efficient way of answering that question. So f composed with g of x is f of g of x, which is f of 1 third x minus 2. And so we get that, the, that f of 1 third x minus 2 is equal to 3 times 1 third x minus 2 plus 2. Distributing the 3 through, we have 3 times 1 third is just 1. So we have x. 3 times negative 2 is minus 6 plus 2 
and so we get x minus 4. And at this point, we can stop because what we found is that f composed with g of x is not equal to just x back. In this case, we got x minus 4, and that doesn't work. We need to be getting exactly x back no matter what x we plug in, and so um, this, uh, this pair of functions are not inverses of each other. So this means that f and g are not inverses of one another. Now, uh, let me point out that um, if you find that two functions are inverses of one another, then that means that the two functions you started with are one-to-one. -one. So this is another way of proving that a function is one-to-one. -one. Uh, however, if you find that two functions are not inverses of one another, that, of course, doesn't say anything about whether the original functions are one-to-one. -one. In fact, both of the functions we have in this problem are one-to-one, -one, uh, and so they both have inverses, it, it's just that the inverse of f is not g, and the inverse of g is not f. We will speak in a moment about how to find inverses of functions. All right, uh, one more example which uh, points out why we need to be uh, careful about the domains of these functions. Uh, let's ask, are f of x equals x squared and g of x equals square root of x inverses? On the face of it, it looks like they might be because uh, squaring a number and taking the square root of a number are essentially opposite types of operations. So let's check. First, we start with f composed with g of x, which is f of g of x, which gives us f of the square root of x, which gives us the square root of x squared. And if I take a number, take its square root, and then square it, I do in fact get back that number. Uh, note that, uh, well, let me, let me leave that uh, aside for a moment. Let's check the other direction. So as I mentioned, just checking one order of the composition isn't good enough to check whether two numbers are inverses or two functions are inverses. You have to check both directions. So this is g of f of x, which is g of x squared, which gives us the square root of x squared. Now, here's the thing. This is not actually equal to x. We've looked at this a couple of times. The square root of x squared is actually the absolute value of x. Now basically the reason why we didn't run into a problem like this in our first composition is that the domain of g uh, was only non-negative numbers. An element x is only in the domain, a number x is only in the domain of g if it's greater than or equal to zero. Now, if I take a number that's greater than or equal to zero, then the square root of x uh, squared uh, does in fact give us uh, x. Uh, however, the um, when we go the other way and we look at g composed with f, the domain of f is all real numbers. And so when we're looking at this composition here, this x is allowed to be any number, positive or negative, which means as we go through this process and we get to the square root of x at this point, that uh, might be equal to x. It will be if x is non-negative, but it won't be if x is negative. So this is not always equal to x. So that means that g and f are not inverses of one another. However, there is a technique that we'll be able to use that we'll see in a moment that will allow us to take 
a restriction of the domain of f that will in fact give us the uh, that these functions are inverses <clears throat> all right so now let's talk about how we actually find inverse functions for functions that are one to one So finding the inverses of one-to-one -one functions. Uh, f of x. And there are a few steps we're going to take here. So step one is we're going to replace uh, f of x with the symbol y, if necessary. Step two because the inverse function exchanges the roles of the inputs and the outputs, we're going to uh, we're going to handle that in this process by exchanging all of the x's and the y's. So we want to exchange all x's and y's. That means replace all your x's with y's and all your y's with x's. Step three solve for y at this and solving for y is something that um, may be easy and may be difficult uh, and if you try to do this process with a function that's not one to one step three is where you'll run into issues uh, because if the function is not one to one you won't be able to solve for y at step three however assuming you are able to do that then step four uh, we go back to the function notation and we replace y with now not f of x but f inverse of x because we've exchanged all the x's and y's and exchanged the roles of the inputs and the outputs so let's look at a simple example let's find the inverse of f of x equals uh, 2x minus 1. So let's go through the steps. Uh, so step one, we're going to write this as an equation uh, where the outputs are written as y. Step two, we're going to exchange all of the x's and y's. And so all of my y's become x's and all of my x's become y's. Step three, I'm going to solve for y. And of course, this takes, uh, this takes a few steps. So I can add one to both sides and get x plus one is equal to two y. And then I can divide both sides by two and get x plus one over two equals y. And then step four, I'm going to replace y with f inverse of x to get the function f of x, f inverse of x is equal to x plus one over two. Uh, now, it's very important when you go through processes like this to check your work. That is to make sure that f composed with f inverse of x equals x and f inverse composed with f of x equals x. Um, I'm not going to do that for this one right here because I'm a little out of space, but we'll do that for the next one. Uh, this is the strategy for finding uh, the inverses of one to one functions pretty much. Uh, the uh, step three is the difficult one, uh, potentially. Uh, everything else is merely notational. Step three is where the meat of the uh, process lies. So let's take another example. Uh, let's find f inverse if f of x is equal to x over x minus three. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, step one, we re replace f of x with y. Uh, 
We go y equals x over x minus 3. Step 2, we replace all of our y's with x's and all of our x's with y's. Uh, depending on your function, you may have more than one x, and if that's the case, you need to replace all of them with y's. Now here's, of course, where things can get a little bit hairy because there are now multiple y's in here, and we've seen that solving for y when there's more than one y in the problem can be difficult. So for step three, we'll try solving this equation for y. Of course, we can't solve for y if it's in the denominator, so we'll multiply both sides by y minus 3. We get x times y minus 3 is equal to y, because these cancel out over here. Distributing, we get xy minus 3x equals y. Uh, so now I'm going to gather all the y's on one side. Um, now, uh, in this case, I think it's going to look a little bit nicer if we gather all the y's on the left. So we get xy minus y minus 3x equals 0. We can add the 3x on the other side and get xy minus y equals 3x. Then uh, we've got all the y's on one side. So we can factor out a y. We get y times x minus 1 is equal to 3x. And then dividing both sides by x minus 1 gives us y equals 3x over x minus 1. So uh, we did it. We were able to solve for y, uh, which uh, is an indication that our function is, in fact, 1 to 1. And so step 4 is simply to write uh, f inverse of x is equal to 3x over x minus 1. All right, so we've got these. Uh, now let's check our work. And uh, I'm going to do this on the next slide so we aren't cramped for space. So we have that f of x is equal to x over uh, x minus uh, uh, x minus 3, and f inverse is 3x over x minus 1. All right, so let's see how we did. So we get f composed with f inverse of x will be f of f inverse of x, of course. So that's f of 3x over x minus 1. Now here's where things are going to uh, get a little bit complicated because now we need to plug 3x over x minus 1 into all the x's in the original function. So we get 3x over x minus 1 over 3x over x minus 1 minus 3. So that's what, um, uh, that's what it looks like when we plug 3x over x minus 1 into the function f. Now, remember at this point, a good strategy is to, when you've got uh, fractions inside fractions like this, is to multiply the top and bottom of the big fraction by the least common denominator of all of the little fractions involved. In this case, that would be x minus 1. So we get 3x over x minus 1 times x minus 1 over, now this x minus 1 in the denominator will have to distribute. So we get 3x over x minus 1 times x minus 1 minus 3 times x minus 1. We get a lot of cancellation. And so uh, we get left with 3x over 3x minus 3 times x minus 1. And so distributing that, we get 3x over 3x minus 3x plus 3. The 3x and the minus 3x will cancel, giving us 3x over 3, which is x. All right, so that confirms one direction. Uh, we do need to check the other one.
We do need to check that if we compose the two functions in the other way, we get x back. So we get f inverse of f of x gives us f inverse of x over x minus 3. And plugging that in, that gives us 3 times x over x minus 3 over x over x minus 3 minus 1. And now, once again, uh, we're going to want to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the least common denominator of all the fractions in the top and bottom of the big fraction. So doing that, uh, we see that the x minus 3 is going to cancel. Uh, the two x minus 3s on the top are going to cancel, and we'll just be left with 3x. On the bottom, x minus 3 has to multiply by x over x minus 3. When we do that, the x's will cancel. And then we get minus 1 times x minus 3. So that'll give us 3x over x minus x plus 3. And we get something actually very similar to uh, the end of the uh, previous computation. So we did, in fact, confirm that the two functions, or that the function we found is the inverse of the original function f that we started with. Now, let's look back at the example we had with x squared and square root of x. So we have f of x equals x squared, and we know um, that uh, f is not 1 to 1. We worked that out uh, right at the beginning. This was our first example of a non 1 to 1 function. Uh, however, if we restrict the domain, if we define a new function that has the same formula but a restricted domain, sort of like a piecewise defined function, then it can become one-to-one. -one. So let's consider the function g of x, which is x squared, but with the condition that x is greater than or equal to zero. So uh, the original function f uh, had a graph that looks like this. Uh, this is a graph of y equals x squared. However, if we only consider the graph of y equals x squared when x is greater than or equal to 0, then that means we're going to erase all the parts of the graph that had x values that were less than 0. And so we'll be left with a graph that looks like this. And this graph does pass the horizontal line test, which means that this graph uh, is, or this function is one to one. By restricting the domain, uh, we have uh, cut down on essentially the problematic areas of the graph. And therefore we've gotten something that is one to one which means we should be able to find its inverse. So let's find g inverse. We're still going to follow the same, uh, the same pattern, but the point is we're going to keep this domain restriction along and we're gonna do the same thing with the domain restriction as we did with everything else. So let's see how that goes. So we've got g of x is x squared with x greater than or equal to 0. Step 1, we replace the g of x with y. So we have y equals x squared with, whoops, sorry, x greater than or equal to 0. That's step 1. So now when we exchange x's and y's, so this would be step 2. I guess step 1 was what we just did. So step two, we're going to exchange all of our x's and y's. So y becomes x, x squared becomes y squared, and x greater than or equal to zero becomes y greater than or equal to zero. So the big point to remember here is that when you are restricting the domain of your function, 
uh, you need to express that restriction in terms of x, and then when you go to um, find your inverse, you replace that x with a y. So in fact, we have that uh, y is greater than or equal to zero as part of our conditions for solving this equation. So now, step three, we're going to try to solve the equation x equals y squared under the condition that y has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, if x is equal to y squared, we know that we can solve that by basically taking the square root of both sides, in which case we get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of x, but we have that y is greater than or equal to zero y greater than or equal to zero will resolve this. Because currently, this statement that we have here, y equals plus or minus the square root of x, is not one equation, it's two equations. In fact, let me go ahead and expand, expand this out. Instead of writing y equals plus or minus the square root of x, what we really have is that y is equal to the square root of x, or y is equal to negative the square root of x. And now the condition that y has to be greater than or equal to zero means that we can eliminate this possibility. And that's because the square root of x is always, uh, always non-negative. The square root of x result is always something bigger than or equal to zero. Uh, and therefore, if y is, has to be, uh, sorry, since the square root of x is greater than or equal to zero, that means that negative square root of x is less than or equal to zero all the time. So if y has to be greater than or equal to zero, it can't be equal to negative square root of x. Now the only exception to this would be when x itself is zero, but if x is zero, then both the square root of x and negative square root of x are both equal to zero. So in that case, the first equation works also. So uh, we can basically use up this condition, y greater than or equal to zero, in order to eliminate one of our possibilities at this point and get that therefore y equals the square root of x. So step four has that we're going to write that g inverse of x is equal to the square root of x. And, uh, and there we go. Uh, so uh, we run into this occasionally where we've got a function, it's not one-to-one, -one, but if we restrict ourselves to a particular domain, then it does become one-to-one -one and we can work with it that way. Uh, and it is helpful that in many cases, um, the quantities we're looking at only make sense for positive numbers. For instance, if we were uh, doing something in geometry and we're saying that, oh, x squared is the area of a square with side lengths of x, well, the negative side lengths don't make sense anyway. So we lose nothing by restricting the domain of the function we're looking at to positive numbers. In which case, the inverse function will tell us the side length of a square with a particular, where the input is the area of that square. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about here for inverse functions is how the graph of the inverse function relates to the graph of the original. graphs of functions and inverses. Now, the first thing that, um, that we want to look at uh, is something that's very useful for us for calculating ranges. So, uh, so let f be a one-to-one -one function, uh, and f inverse its inverse. we have that the domain of f is equal to the range of f inverse. And that's because 
f and if and f inverse are functions where the inputs and outputs have been exchanged. The domain of f is the set of all possible inputs to the function f. But the inputs to f are exactly the outputs of f inverse. And so the set of all inputs to f is the set of all outputs of f inverse. In other words, the domain of f is the range of f inverse. And similarly, the domain of f inverse is equal to the range of f. Now, the reason why this is helpful is that it's a lot easier to compute domains based on the formulas of a function, uh, formula that's given by a function than, uh, than the range is. So, uh, let's look at an example. Uh, an example that we did earlier. So let's let f of x be x over x minus 3. And we saw before that that means that f inverse of x is equal to 3x over x minus 1. We, uh, we had this function and its inverse from before. So let's consider the domains, in, uh, the domains of each of these functions, which will also tell us the ranges of the other ones. So the domain of f is the set of all numbers except 3 because there's a, an x minus 3 expression in the denominator. And if x were 3, then uh, this uh, fraction would be undefined. But that means that that's also the range of f inverse. So the, the function f inverse takes all values, all real numbers except 3 as outputs. Similarly, we can say that the domain of f inverse is the set of all real numbers other than 1 because there's an x minus 1 expression in the denominator of a fraction. But that's also the range of f. So one place that you might use inverse functions in a place where it's not immediately obvious that you can is if a problem asks you for the range of a function. If you want to know the range of a function and if that function happens to be one to one, then a good way of doing that is to find the inverse to that function and find the domain of the inverse because the domain of the inverse is the range of the original. And as I said, a lot of times it's easier to find the range that way than by uh, uh, doing, doing other methods. Um, in particular, uh, the only method that we've had up till now of finding the range of a function was graphing it and looking at uh, all the y values that were covered by points on the graph. Uh, when we've got a function like x over x minus 3, this takes a little bit to, uh, to graph. Uh, we're, we are going to be talking about that later on in the, um, in the course, but the nice thing about the inverse functions is that they're able to answer the question of what's the range of this function even without having to graph it. But let's suppose that we do want to compare the actual graphs of a function and its inverse. So uh, remember that a point... Uh, x comma y is on the graph of f if and only if uh, f of x equals y. But by the definition of the inverse function, f of x equals y if and only if, if f inverse of y equals x. Here I'm assuming that f is 1 to 1 and therefore has an inverse. But this is the same thing as saying that the point y comma x is on the graph of f inverse. So what this tells us is that the graph of f inverse is obtained by exchanging uh, the coordinates 
of each point on the graph of x. So uh, let's, uh, let's see an example and see how this works. So, uh, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and run this. So, let's take the function uh, y equals 2x minus 1, or f of x equals 2x minus 1. Let's graph this out. Well, this is a linear function uh, written in slope-intercept form, and so we can graph it fairly easily. The minus 1 in the formula tells us that the y-intercept of this point is at 0, comma, negative 1, and the 2 coefficient on the x tells us that the slope is 2, which means that this line will go through the points 0, comma, 1, uh, and then move over, uh, over 1 and up, 2 to get to the point 1 comma 1 and then over 1 and up 2 in order to get 2 comma 3 and here's the graph of the function f of x equals 2x minus 1. Now as we can see this function is 1 to 1 and therefore it has an inverse. Rather than exactly computing uh, the inverse, let's just go ahead and graph it using the fact that a point is on the graph of f inverse uh, if and only if you get it by exchanging the first and second coordinates of a point on the original function f. So, uh, for instance, we have that, uh, and I won't do this for all the points, but, uh, but I'll do one or two of them. So we have that 0, 1 is on the graph of f, which means that f of 0 is negative 1. But that's exactly the same thing as saying that if f inverse of negative 1 is 0. But that means that the point negative 1, 0 is on the graph of f inverse. So... That means that I can put the point uh, negative 1, 0 on the graph of f inverse. All right, let's do the same thing with the point uh, 1, 1 on, is on the graph of f, and therefore that means that f of 1 equals 1, and therefore f inverse of 1 equals 1 also. So we exchange the role of the inputs and the outputs, but in this case, the input and the output are the same. And so uh, we get the same, uh, we get that f inverse of 1 is 1, and therefore we get the point 1, 1 is actually on f inverse as well. So that's a point that's shared between the graph of f and its inverse. And then uh, we also have, because the point 2, comma 3 is on the graph of f, the point 3, comma 2 is on the graph of f f inverse. And therefore, we can graph f inverse by connecting those points there. Uh, we can also, as it turns out, just use uh, use these points to work out the uh, the value of f in, or the formula for f inverse. Uh, we can see it's a linear function. We can just read off of these points that the slope is one half. So f inverse of x is 1 half x, and then it turns out that the uh, y-intercept there is 1 half also. And so there's what the graphs of f and f inverse look like. Now, this process of exchanging the coordinates, um, the first and second coordinates here, can be expressed in the, uh, in the following way. The two lines, the uh, the red and the blue graphs here, you can see have been 
uh, are reflections of one another across the line y equals x. And in fact, this is uh, this is just another way of expressing this same this same principle that the graph of f inverse is obtained by exchanging these coordinates. So let's uh, let me write that down on on the next page, and then we'll do a slightly more complex example with this. Uh, so uh, the graph of f inverse is the reflection of the graph of f across the line y equals x. So uh, let's take another example um, and uh, find the inverse. Uh, the graph of f is given, find the graph of f inverse. Alright, so let's take this here. 5, 10, 8, Negative 10, negative 4, negative 8. Okay, and we're going to graph F and in blue. So I'm going to do that by, uh, by selecting uh, specific points, and then we'll be able to use those. Uh, to graph the function. Okay, so uh, first of all, we look at the graph of f and we can see that it is one to one. It passes the horizontal line test. No horizontal line will cross it more than once, which is good. So now what we want to do is uh, for each one of these points, we're going to get a point on the graph of f inverse, which is obtained by exchanging the um, first and second coordinates here. So we can see that this point is negative 7, 8. That means that a point on the graph of f inverse is at 8, negative 7. So we've got 8 here and negative 7. So because the point negative 7, 8 is on the graph of f, the point 8, negative 7 is on the graph of f inverse. All right, so then we've got the point negative uh, 3, 6 on the graph of f. And so we have the point 6, negative 3 on the graph of f inverse, uh, and we continue like this, negative 1, 4, uh, and so we get 4, negative 1. Uh, we have the point uh, 2, 3 on f, and so 3, 2 on f inverse, we have the point uh, uh, 4, comma, negative 1 on the graph of f, and so we have the point negative 1, comma, 4 on the graph of um, on the graph of f inverse. We have the point 7, comma, negative 3 on f. And so we have the point negative 3, comma, 7 on the graph of f inverse. And then uh, 9, comma, negative 6. Therefore, uh, and therefore negative 6, comma, 9. Whoops, I've 
we've got a little bit too um, too far up and then finally 10 comma negative 8 uh, which gives us negative 8 comma 10 so uh, by connecting up all of these points we can find the graph of f inverse in red corresponding where the graph of f is the one given in blue one thing that you'll notice about this particular uh, function and inverse is that they are very close to to each other. In fact, it's entirely possible for a function to be its own inverse. Um, it, uh, and uh, such functions uh, are interesting in their own uh, in their own right. They correspond to operations that you do where if you do them twice, you just get back to where you started. So for instance, if you had a function that represented rotating something by 180 degrees, then if you applied that function twice, you would just get, get back exactly to where you started. That would be an example of a function that is its own inverse. In this case, the function is not quite its own inverse, but uh, we can see that it's sort of close because the graphs are close to one another. So uh, that's the idea. We can also see that, um, uh, that the functions are in fact reflected uh, the graphs are in fact reflected across this line uh, y equals x as we mentioned before uh, however reflecting across the line y equals x is not really the best way to think about it when actually going to graph it the best way to think about it is just exchanging the roles of the inputs and the outputs